So tonight we will be describing how schools currently include people with disabilities in their emergency plans. We're going to identify the need for more personalized supports through tools like an individual emergency and lockdown plan or a sensory toolkit. And then we're going to discuss strategies for preparing for interactions with first responders. Um, and you may be wondering why now? Well, a handful of people have reached out over the past several months looking for resources on this third topic, um, wrestling with the idea of how to make their students or their children more comfortable with and feel safer around emergency personnel. Um, so I'm just happy to open that discussion to a wider audience. Uh, but I also think that our current environment and the restricted, op restricted operations of COVID um, actually provide a natural opportunity to revise emergency plans in general. Um, so as schools are starting to reopen and return to in-person learning, they might be making some changes to what a fire drill or a lockdown looks like with social distancing in place. Um, and I wanna be sure we jump on that opportunity to say, hey, while we're here at the table, can we make this all more inclusive, more accessible to myself or to my student? I'm going to be using the word emergency a lot tonight, so I thought it was important to take a moment to explain what I meant by that word. Um, so here I have a list of three definitions, what it means to be safe, how I define a disaster, and what counts as an emergency. Um, safe means protected from danger or risk, not likely to be harmed or lost. So there are a hundred different ways to be safe. We use one set of safety skills for handling scissors or kitchen knives. Um, and another set of rules for safe driving. We wear special gear to be safe while we're playing sports, um, but we need different equipment to be safe riding a bike versus rock climbing. Um, so some of the strategies we'll learn about tonight can apply to all of these situations. For example, we're going to learn about how to make a social story. And you can adapt that to be about any new event that you need to prepare for. Um, some of those events could be disasters sudden events that might cause a lot of damage to property or have the potential to injure people. A natural disaster is one type of emergency. And natural disasters include things like hurricanes, tornadoes, snowstorms, earthquakes. Um, and I can certainly share more information about natural disasters and how you can prepare for those kinds of events. Um, but for the most part, our focus tonight is going to be on the kinds of emergencies that you practice for at school. So emergencies are all urgent situations that require immediate action. And when we learn about a fire drill or we practice a lockdown, it's usually just a pretend emergency. But that practice is important for learning what to do and how to be safe if there was ever a real danger. Our schools and our teachers do a lot of work to keep us safe and have thought about each aspect of preparation. And that's awesome because I don't have to worry or be scared about an emergency if I know that there is a plan in place that includes me and I know what my job is in that plan. So I have listed here the four components to an evacuation plan as defined by the National Fire Protection Association. Um, and those four are notification, wayfinding, use of the way, and access to assistance. So each of these components has implications for people with disabilities. And there are ways to make each step of evacuation or other emergency plans more accessible. So I want to break those down a little bit in the next few slides. Notification is the way that you receive information about the emergency. So it's important that this information be provided in multiple ways. If you think about a fire alarm as an example, um, the fire alarm in your school probably has audio as well as visual. It's got a loud noise and it has flashing lights. If I had only one way of telling people about a fire, then that message wouldn't reach everyone. Um, so my classmate who is deaf needs the lights to help them tell when there's a fire drill and my classmate who is blind uses the noise to alert her. Um, and actually, there's even a new technology called directional sound, which uses different tones and intensities to help identify what direction you should go towards to exit the building in emergency. And if neither lights nor sounds are a reliable notification method for someone, um, they might need to access that information tactily through their sense of touch. 
So something like a personal pager could be used to vibrate to alert them of an emergency. And this picture in the top right corner is an example of a vibrating pager. Um, this one indicates what type of sound has been detected, whether it's a doorbell or a phone ringing or a fire alarm. Um, so all of these different methods of notification um, can be helpful for people with different needs. And some of them also might be more difficult for some people to process. Um, some of us put on our air protectors when a fire alarm goes off, and that's fine, as long as you're still getting the information you need through some channel. And finally, another concern about notification devices in terms of methodology is um, flashing lights can trigger migraines or seizures in some people. Um, so one suggestion on building a more accessible building-wide notification system um, is to make sure that the alarms are all synchronized so that lights blink at the same frequency at the same time. Um, and this prevents someone from getting stuck in a hallway where one end of the hallway is blinking at odds with the other end. And for alerts that use words to describe the emergency, we want to be sure that the words we choose are easily understood. Um, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, or FEMA, advocates for using plain language instead of codes for things like lockdown drills. So we want to make it as clear as possible for people to know not just that something is happening, but also what type of emergency it is and how they are expected to respond. These are all accessibility concerns that have to do with notification. So the second component is wayfinding. This is how you're going to navigate your way through the building or to a safe spot or along an evacuation route. And just like with notification, we want to give people multiple ways of accessing that information. Um, this means light up exit signs, but also braille and tactile signs, and maybe pictograms, pictographs. Um, the ADA standards for this kind of signage give lots of details about things like using raised text, for case letters, um, a plain font on a contrasting color background. Um, so you can look up the 2010 ADA standards um, as adopted by the Department of Justice. If you want more information about that, um, it gets into specifics of character size, line spacing, installation height. Um, but the point that I wanted to make about wayfinding is that in addition to marking where the exit route is, it should either be marked as accessible or have directions to point someone towards another route if this one is not accessible. Having an accessible route means that there aren't barriers like narrow spaces, steep paths, or uneven surfaces. Other examples of barriers might be door locks or door latches that require significant force or fine motor skills to operate. And one of the most common reasons a route wouldn't be accessible is because of stairs. Finally, the last component of evacuation plan is access to assistance. So most multi-level public buildings probably have something called areas of refuge. And these are designated spots where they might keep a call box or a radio for people to request help in an emergency. These are usually located in a stairwell. Um, and if you have this type of device in your building, one thing you should check is whether there are instructions to tell people how it works, um, who responds to that radio and what kind of help is provided. So by putting that information in the call box, you allow an individual who maybe has a hearing or a speech impairment to know what to expect. So even if they are unable to fully access the communication system, they have the reassurance that help is coming. And in addition to being places to ask for help, areas of refuge are often the primary evacuation site for individuals who entered the building using the elevator. To put that more plainly, um, if my student uses a wheelchair, we are expected to go to the stairwell, close the fire resistant door, um, which is a door that they probably couldn't have opened if they were on their own, and to wait. So while the rest of our colleagues and our classmates evacuate the building, um, we are supposed to sit and wait for the fire department to come get us. Now, 
personally, I'm not satisfied with that solution. Um, I don't want anybody feeling forgotten or left behind or deprioritized in an emergency. And I also have concerns about what if we need to evacuate for some reason other than fire. Um, I've been in buildings before where someone pulls the fire alarm because they smell a gas leak. Is an area of refuge still the best plan for that type of emergency? Um, so we really need to establish protocols that allow all individuals, regardless of disability, to evacuate the building at the same time. Luckily, there are plenty of solutions already available for this. So carrying techniques are one possibility. Um, I'm not going to talk about carrying techniques too much because I think the potential for harm there is not insignificant. And they also limit your options in terms of who can assist. Um, so carrying usually requires multiple people and people with some degree of strength. Um, but carry slings or carry style chairs are one option for aided evacuation and they are the lower cost option. Um, another option is a stair travel device. So having a stair travel device benefits a lot of people, not only wheelchair users or other people who have a known mobility limitation, um, but during an emergency situation, people might be unable to get out quickly for a variety of other reasons, maybe respiratory, cardiac, or sensory impairments, or an injury that occurred during the emergency. Um, so the stair travel device that I would recommend based on the research of RESNA, which is the Rehabilitation Engineering Society of North America, and they are the governing body for assistive technology professionals. Um, but their recommendation is a track style stair travel device. So what that looks like. Um, here are two examples. And in fact, Resna suggests that public buildings should be routinely equipped with a stair descent device at every floor um, along each stairway, not including any additional chairs that are required for students or employees with a known need for the device. So that goes back to the idea that this can benefit a lot of people. And we wanna be sure that there are enough chairs available for the people we know need it, as well as extra for the people we don't know need it. So I have two examples of track type chairs here. Um, and the track type chairs both have rollers, treads, and they have braking mechanisms. So they can be braked not only on a flat surface, but midway down the stairs, you can lock that brake and it's not going anywhere. Um, advantages to this design are that they can be used with just a single operator. Um, they're also pretty efficient to maneuver through landings and around corners. And again, it's a faster speed of travel so that everyone is evacuating the building at the same time. So on the top right is the evacue track chair. Um, this sits fairly low to the ground. It doesn't have any handles in the way of transfers. So it's easy to help a person into it from a seated position. You have a lot of flexibility um, as an assistant to help with that transfer from different angles or positions. Um, on the bottom is a evacuation chair from Stryker. Um, both of these chairs do have safety belts. You can't really see them very well on this picture, um, but it has a buckle at shoulder height uh, on the lap and across the shins. Um, the Stryker chair also has handles at the bottom of the chair so that a second person could assist with lifting if you encounter any obstacles aside from stairs. Um, both of these chairs do require that the person being evacuated is in a seated position. Um, so if that's not possible, maybe because the individual has potentially been injured and needs to stay lying flat on their back, um, then a device more like a medevac sled might be used. But in general, the stair travel with a track type tread um, is a good first choice. So I'm going to come back to this slide for a moment. Um, evacuation plans and procedures should address the needs of all facility occupants, including those with disabilities. So this is a statement from the US Access Board. The, the concept is supported by other documents um, from the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. It's supported by the ADA. It's supported by the large body of research on emergency planning, which tells us that effective crisis management begins with leadership at the top. And I mention this because 
the top-down approach is in direct contrast to the existing model in schools now, where if a student needs an accommodation, then the burden of responsibility usually falls to the student or to the parents to initiate the formation of an emergency plan for that child. So I'd like to propose another role for schools. Not only should we be making our overall plans more accessible and inclusive, like having a stair travel device from the get-go, but we also need to provide a natural avenue for considering accommodations and modifications on a case-by-case -case basis that meets individual student needs. This concept is called an Individual Emergency and Lockdown Plan, or an IELP. And I'm borrowing this term from Laura Clark and her colleagues um, who coined it in a publication from uh, 2014, I think. Um, but you can call it anything you would like. The idea is just that every time you meet to review an IEP plan or a 504 accommodation plan, you take that opportunity to add in one more question. Is there a need for a specific plan for this student's individual needs if there were a crisis in the building? So if the answer to that question is yes, then you document those accommodations. Um, some of them could be listed as supplementary aids and services in the IEP, or the entire emergency plan might be a document attached to the IEP. So they would get reviewed yearly and any strengths or concerns could be noted that the student might be having, um, particularly in responding to novel situations. Some common barriers to plan for might be identifying equipment like an evacuation chair that would allow the child to be safely carried out of the building assuming that the elevator is probably not going to be available, um, providing a visual schedule or other picture-based instruction for drills, and planning for some form of identification, especially if a student is non-speaking, to be able to convey critical information to first responders. So I'm going to show you what that template, what that template might look like. And This is available um, as an editable Word document for you in that resource folder so that you can make whatever changes you might like. Um, but this template is one that I adapted from a document created by a school district in Minnesota. Uh, so thank you to Jamie Nord, Sarah Brown, and Troy Ferguson for their work on the original version. Um, it's got two parts here. So first is a checklist for determining if I need an individual emergency and lockdown plan. So reasons that the answer might be yes, um, could be a lack of cooperation or self-management skills, anxiety or impulsive behavior that might interfere with my ability to follow directions. Um, I might have a physical disability or a medical concern that interferes with my ability to use the standard evacuation plan. Um, or any other reason that I might require special instructions or accommodations. So for some of us that might be sensory processing or sensory sensitivities that make it difficult to comply under the pressures of a fire alarm, for example. Um, even Actually, if I would... But these emergency plans attached to IP. I remember when there was the, the bomb threats and he was acting like and they got up so mad at them. Garbage. Mute that, sorry. Um, so if, if um, even if usually I might be able to carry out instructions independently, um, perhaps under the pressures of a fire alarm, that's a concern for me. Um, and yes, these, this template is available for you. It will be in that shared folder that I will share that link right now in the chat. And you are free to use it um, however you like and however it fits for your students or yourself. Um, so after the checklist, if the answer is yes, you've determined that, yeah, I do need an individual emergency and lockdown plan. Um, we have the next three pages are where you would document the specific equipment or accommodations needed in order to make emergency drills a successful experience for myself. Um, it would start by what specialized equipment is needed in the building and where will it be kept? Um, the answer to that might be if I have a special evacuation chair that's kept in the stairwell. 
Um, or if there's specialized equipment that must remain with the student, um, part B, what kind of equipment might that be? Um, the sensory toolkit that I'm gonna talk about in a moment might be something that stays with the student or some form of identification or communication tools. Um, part C, describe any identified behaviors that occur to a degree that could interfere with the student's capacity to follow procedures. Um, and this is the kind of information that would be particularly helpful if there was a substitute teacher or some other support staff that was less familiar with and maybe not involved in the creation of the plan. Kind of put these, um, I kind of put these portions in order of priority here of what they would need to know. So the general considerations don't come down until part D, just saying that staff is gonna remain with the student the student is going to be calmly informed of what is happening throughout the process. Um, a reminder that the elevator can't be used during a drill or emergency, if that's true for your building. If not, then certainly take that out. Um, and that the plan is going to be reviewed and revised as needed based on changes in schedule or mobility, health status, behavioral needs. So part E is what does this student require in terms of staff assistance? If they do need a staff to physically or otherwise help them to evacuate the building, who's going to be in charge of that? And you wanna make sure that you train at least twice as many people as you actually need. So it has the name of the assigned staff person and the name of the backup staff. And then do you need staff to do anything else? Um, do you need staff to carry a wheelchair out of the building so that the student can get back into it after they go down the track chair on the stairs? Or do you need staff to carry a communication device or some other sort of toolkit or medicine? Part F is when you really go into detail about what specific plans this child is going to be following. Um, so are they going to the same place as the rest of the students in their class when the building is evacuated in a fire drill? Or are they going to an alternative location? The details of that plan can go in part F. And if they're supposed to be exiting the building, but they can't, what's the plan gonna be? So maybe in part one, plan A was, they're going to the same spot as everyone else in their class, but they're using an alternative stairwell that has their evacuation chair in it. In number two, you could put, well, if for some reason we can't do that, what's plan B? Are we gonna wait in the area of refuge? Um, part three, what about disasters and emergencies when you're supposed to remain in the building? Do you need any special plans? Are you going to a different place, staying with your class? Um, do you need any accommodations to, for instance, the protective posture that is being taught for tornado drills? Is that posture one that works for your body or do you need a different plan? And then part four, when students are to remain in the classroom, what kind of plans or accommodations might be needed there. So you would document the training that's needed, who has been trained, and provide a copy of that plan to everyone involved. So this should be shared with teachers and support staff, certainly. Um, I would also add that you want to make a copy of this plan available to the student as well. So in whatever format makes the most sense for that individual. If you are a student who's helping to write the plan and receiving it in written form works for you, great. But if you need it in some other form, if you need social stories or picture schedules to demonstrate the different adaptations in your plan, just make sure that the student has that level of ownership and involvement. Okay, switching back to slides here. Um, so some of the strategies and accommodations that you include in go. Some of the strategies and accommodations um, that you include in your individual emergency and lockdown plan might be sensory tools. Um, these tools would likely fall under that second category of equipment that remains with the student. Unless you have multiple kits, um, then you could keep them in each classroom that the student goes to throughout the day. Um, so I've put together some questions to help you brainstorm what might be included in that kit. Um, and these are questions that you can reword, you can use symbols to represent, make up a worksheet for the student to be able to fill it out on their own because that is the goal, right? That we are having um, 
active participation and ownership in our own emergency planning. So when the school is in lockdown, um, students have two big jobs, which are to sit still and to be silent. And that can be incredibly difficult. So my first two questions here were, what can help me stay quiet and what can help me sit still? Um, some examples might be edible snacks, uh, chewable jewelry, communication cards for things that I might not be able to say out loud, um, handheld fidgets, a weighted lap pad, a stuffed animal or another comfort object. Um, and then the question of what can help me manage noises or lights, headphones, hear, earplugs, ear defenders, sunglasses, those kind of tools. And then what can help me remember or what can really help me um, react? Copy of the social story about a fire drill, um, picture schedule, other visual cues, emergency contact card, these are all things that might fit within the sensory toolkit, even though some of them aren't quite what you would think of as sensory regulation tools. Um, they could fit in the same spot. And here are some visual examples of things that you might include. So the first example is actually candy. Um, I saw an IELP that lists eight packs of Smarties candies in the emergency kit of a fifth grader with autism. And you know what, I think that's totally valid. I have worked in multiple classrooms where students had a hard time understanding what was happening during the lockdown and they were not able to regulate their noises. Um, and it's a safety concern. So honestly, if I thought eight packs of Smarties would have been helpful, then I probably would have been handing them out left and right like Halloween candy. Um, but obviously that's up to the individual IEP team and the student to decide if edible snacks are useful or an allowable tool for them. Um, other options might include jewelry or chewable jewelry, which is generally made of durable silicon and it's both quiet and reusable. It's also easily sanitizable. So there's an example of a feather pendant here um, and a wide cuff bracelet and then a handheld raccoon chewable. Um, these particular items are all from the website Stimtastic. Um, and I actually have one of those pendants in my sensory kit here, um, which is a pencil case. So it's nice and compact. This is one way that you might carry your sensory kit. Um, and the chewables come in different thicknesses, different textures for light chewing, moderate heavy chewing. Um, my sensory kit also has some fidgets. So one of my favorites is the textured therapy tangle. Um, some other examples of quiet fidgets. You might have the marble maze. Um, this is a cloth keychain that has stitching to make a maze and you move a marble around with your fingers. Um, a squishy toy. This pink seal is a slow rising foam. So when you squish it, you watch it come back to full size. Um, there's a blue squeezy stress ball. And the, those last two, the stress ball and the tangle are from trainerswarehouse.com, another resource if you're looking for places to get um, kind of a variety of different fidget toys, try out, see what works for you. Uh, especially if you're looking for things that are appropriate for a wide range of ages. ages. They have a lot of things that are suitable for more mature students. Um, I will put those links in the chat as well. Okay. Um, so another thing you might keep in your emergency sensory toolkit is ear protection. So you definitely want to try this one out before just sticking it in a toolkit. Um, try different styles, see which one works for you. Um, their headphones come in a couple different varieties. So you have on-ear headphones, which kind of have a slightly smaller earpiece. Oftentimes it's around and it goes on top of your ear. This could have active noise canceling um, technology in it or not. And then there are over-ear headphones. So have a slightly larger cup that goes around your ear and your ear fits within it. Um, and the difference in how these feel pressure-wise might be significant for some people. Um, 
Ear muffs and ear defenders are usually the over ear style. And then you could also consider ear plugs. Uh, so in the top right corner, I have an example of reusable silicon earplugs. So these are a little bit less invasive than the um, foam type, the disposable kinds that you usually find on, at drugstores and whatnot. Um, they feel more like the earpiece to like a set of headphones. And it's got 25 decibels of noise reduction, supposedly. Um, obviously, that's going to vary across environment and depending on the fit. Um, but it's a good option to try out. I believe those earplugs are from Loop. Um, don't have the website on hand, but if you Google Loop earplugs, you can find those. Um, and ear defenders, you can find lots of different kinds on Amazon. Um, you just want to look at the, the fit and the sizing on that. Oops. All right, so another thing to include in your emergency kit is some form of identification. So I do have a template for a wallet sized ID card that you can fill in and print out. Um, one side of it has your name, age, date of birth, spot for you to put a picture. And then the other side is a disclosure. It says, I have a disability. Um, I cannot, and some things you might write here are see distances, hear you, follow multi-step directions, tolerate loud noises or bright lights. Um, alternatively, instead of I cannot, you might write, I need you too, and give some tips for how a first responder or a rescue personnel might best interact with you. Um, the second line I have on mine is I communicate using. You might write a speech device, American Sign Language, gestures and vocalizations, Spanish. And then finally, if I need help, please contact. So you would put the name and phone number of your emergency contact there. And you can easily swap out the placeholders here to add whatever information feels most important to you. Um, and if you have actual ID cards, then this card can get tucked behind or taped to the back of your school ID. Otherwise, you can just print it on sort of heavy cardstock type paper, cut it out, and then fold it in half to make it double sided. Some other strategies for identification include wearable tags or bracelets. So I really like the website ifineedhelp.org for the range of options that they provide. Um, I have a picture here of their shoelace tag, but it's also available as a necklace, as a keychain, um, as a reflective patch, uh, even as a seatbelt cover. So all of these items have space for your name, your phone number, and potentially allergies, as well as a scannable QR code. So the cool thing about that QR code is that someone can update that user profile to indicate relevant information in the moment. So it's not a static repository of maybe like just a home address and parent cell phone number. Um, instead, if for instance, I get lost in the crowd at a relief shelter, um, my parent or my support person can log into the website from their phone and add a note to my potential responders to tell them that maybe I need medical attention, maybe I was impacted by missing their medications today, or to tell them that, hey, please help her find her way back to the registration table. Um, someone named Beth wearing a yellow shirt is waiting for her. So it gives you a lot of flexibility in making things really relevant up to the minute. Um, if a more traditional bracelet style is more your preference, then you might also consider a road ID product. Um, those are silicon bracelets. They come in a variety of colors. Um, they also have a nylon alternative, but all of their bracelets are engraved with a stainless steel plate that has the wearer's information. Um, so there are lots of options for IDs is the moral of this story. Um, choose what makes sense for you and what will be the most comfortable. So we've got fidget tools, headphones, and identification in our toolkit right now. Um, the last category of tools was things to help us remember and respond. So this might include picture schedules and social stories. And these strategies might already be part of your school day. So it's fantastic to take the strategies and tools that are successful for you already um, and apply them to these new situations. So for anyone who is unfamiliar with social stories, 
They are a great way to introduce new routines and learn how to respond appropriately to unfamiliar situations. So the Assert Collaborative here in Pennsylvania has a great library of published social stories that I will share and link to. Um, but sometimes it's also going to be more effective to write your own, um, to fill in the specifics of your environment. So some general guidance for writing your own social story. Uh, they're usually written from the perspective of the reader. This means speaking in first person using I statements. And it also means including details that are specific and personal. So the student who is using the story as a tool can be the one to help write it and can even take or pose for photographs to illustrate different parts of the story and really make that their own. Um, most of your sentences are going to be descriptive, um, providing facts about the situation, offering vocabulary for what the reader might feel or experience, affirming the actions in the story. Um, those are all examples of descriptive sentences. Um, and then you'll have some directive sentences which tell the reader what they can do. So this might include if then statements and it might also identify who can help whether it be peers or teachers or whoever is likely to be close at hand to offer guidance. So I'm going to share a sample narrative about a fire drill. And I have a copy of this in the resource folder as well as the um, fire drill and a lockdown drill. So these are all um, free source images without copyright attached to them. And I would expect that using this, you would probably wanna replace it with your own images, photographs of yourself um, or your student. But this example says, at school, we learn about being safe. We practice ways to keep us safe. My school has a fire drill every month to teach us what to do if there's a real fire. Fire alarm is loud. It needs to be loud so that everyone can hear the bell no matter where they are in the school. It also has a flashing light. I can cover my ears or put my headphones on. I should still be able to follow directions from the teacher. When I hear the alarm, I will walk to the door and line up with my classmates. We will follow the teacher outside and I will wait outside with my class until my teachers say the fire drill is over. Then we can return to the building. So it uses a couple different types of sentences, both descriptive and directive, and you can add more to fit the specifics of your situation then you would want to read and reread the story before the experience. Um, so the finished story could be read every day. It could be read once a week. Or for some people, it might just be making that available within the emergency kit, depending on the needs of the student. Yes, I can reshare that link. Um, the link to the shoelace product um, is if I need help.org. And these slides are all in PDF format. So when you open the slides themselves, they'll, they um, should take you to that website as well. All right. If you are a parent or a student, um, your teacher or your related service team, like maybe a speech therapist, are great resources for helping generate social stories. And this is part of the education piece of disaster preparedness. Um, teachers are already doing a lot of work around this topic. So I see classes talking about community helpers in preschool and in kindergarten. And that evolves into curriculum around fire safety month maybe for elementary school students. So parents and students can carry over those lessons from school and use them as a launching point for your own conversations. The tools we learn, we use to learn about emergencies and fire and first responders and fire departments and those kind of things at school. Um, books, videos, role play activities, live meetings. Um, I'm sure that every elementary special education classroom has some version of like this type of book. Um, even firefighters hug their moms. It's something simple that teaches us the basic functions of what this person's job is and what uniform they wear, how do I recognize them. 
From there, you can watch video clips to get more details. What does a siren or a fire alarm actually sound like? And then let me play that video on my iPad where I have complete control over it so that that noise becomes more manageable and I can work up to hearing it at full volume in the classroom. Then maybe let's play with costumes um, or go visit a real firehouse so we can see and touch the gear that our firefighters use. These are all great introductory activities. I do wanna point out that these lessons, these type of books, they all portray our first responders as positive and approachable. This is going to feel disingenuous to some of my friends out there. Um, at the very least, it won't provide quite enough information for older students. Because once we understand the role of a police officer or a firefighter or an EMT, we then need to ask the question, what is my role in the interaction? So for that, I'm going to look for different qualities in books. Um, and the children's librarians at Oakland Public Library have put out a great resource about evaluating books about police. Uh, some of the questions that they ask include, does the book match or conflict with my lived experiences? So if I'm a student who has seen a relative get arrested, if I'm a student who has watched news or read stories that concern me. If I'm a student whose parents have had conversations about the risk of deportation um, because of their immigration status. I mean, all of these lived experiences could conflict with some of the messages that are out there um, for individuals with disabilities about police and first responder interactions. So we wanna make sure that the materials we're choosing acknowledge a variety of feelings and acknowledge that perhaps there are feelings of fear and anxiety. We also want to make sure that the materials we choose represent diverse characters and not only that we all see ourselves portrayed in the characters but that there's no bias in who is being portrayed in which role. And then finally we want materials that provide information. So provide information about expected behavior, how we are supposed to interact in those situations, but also provide experience about our rights in those situations. Um, and for children, this might be as simple as knowing that you have the right to ask for an adult or a teacher to be present if a police officer is asking you questions. And then I'm going to also put in the chat um, a couple books that have helped people have difficult conversations specifically about police involved shootings. Um, so those two books are Mama, Did You Hear the News? and Something Happened in Our Town. So why does this matter? Um, multiple studies have suggested that, for instance, individuals with autism are more likely than neurotypical peers to have personal encounters with the police. Um, the statistic that I've seen cited lots of places in the past year um, was actually a study from 1993, so I'm not putting too much weight on the specific number, um, but that data indicated that individuals with disabilities are seven times more likely to encounter police in their lifetime. Um, whether or not that specific number is still accurate, it does charge us to consider the intersection of other factors. Uh, how much higher is that number for boys than girls? or for black students compared to white students. And this is a concern for parents, for students, for us all as a community. So we want to be preparing ourselves with the best information possible to feel like we know what to expect and to have concrete tips for making these encounters safe and successful. So an example of providing actionable information is this social story from the Assert Autism Collaborative. Um, it describes how you should keep your hands where the officer can see them. Um, and the next page, it also specifies that you need to stay in the car unless the officer tells you to get out of the car. Um, these are the kind of concrete directions that some of our students and ourselves might find helpful for navigating that situation. Checklists are another way we prepare for, 
prepare for novel situations. Um, and remember that an emergency doesn't have to be a big, scary thing. Uh, part of the reason we talk about and plan for things now is so that it's less scary and less dangerous when it does happen. So something like an automobile accident or even a traffic stop could be classified potentially as an emergency. Um, but that doesn't mean it's a big, scary situation if we're prepared for it. Um, so an information card like this could be kept in your glove box and it acts both as a memory aid and as a communication tool. So if you ever are in a car accident, even if it's minor, then there's certain information that you want to have easy access to. So you can have one card that's already filled out with your own name, your license and insurance number, and have that ready to hand to another driver or to a police officer when they ask for that information. And then you can keep a few blank cards in the glove box on which the other driver could fill in the information that you'll want about them. Um, so honestly, I think this should be standard practice. Even if you as a student aren't old enough to drive or aren't working towards your license, um, ask your parents, print these off, keep them in the glove box because everyone can use some extra support in a hectic situation. And I did want to talk a little bit about some other training tools available. Um, so Florio is a virtual reality platform. And this tool has been trialed at CHOP at their Center for Autism Research. Um, I believe it's also been trialed in some of the classrooms in the Chester County Intermediary Unit. Um, but it's basically VR for practicing exposure to different situations. So they have simulations for a police interaction, and they have simulation for a TSA checkpoint. So I do want to share an example of what that looks like. Um, and for anyone who is not familiar with VR in general, um, usually what it looks like is you have a headset, like a pair of goggles. Um, and in this, in this case, an iPhone sits right in front of the headset. And that's what the screen is that you're actually looking at. Um, and the Florio app comes with a, a second, secondary portal so that a teacher or a parent or someone else can be watching the same scene on an iPad and helping you through that. Let me share um, sound with you as well. Here is what that actions, and I'm going to click into the first in the series. This one does not have a lot of uh, distractions here. Um, the types of distractions that we do add are things like more background noise. Sometimes there are cars driving by on the street here or pedestrians that are walking by. Um, there might be a police car down the street with its lights on. Sometimes it's nighttime. Occasionally there is a person that sits over here on the bench, which can add another level of anxiety for the learner because they feel like they're being watched. Um, but in any case, in this, this set of lessons, we give the coach the tools to puppeteer the police officer because the goal is for the learner to role play as if this was a real life scenario. So I'll start the lesson here. Hey there. And we're greeted by the police officer. He said, hey there. And so uh, if the learner doesn't respond or says something that's hard to understand, the coach could use one of those orange prompts in the center of the screen there. But hopefully our learner here said hi or hey or his favorite way of saying hi. Can I talk to you a sec? We have some questions like this one, which can be difficult to answer for some of our more literal learners because the police officer has already greeted us. He's already said hi to us. Why is he now asking, can I talk to you for a sec? So that can be a question that can be difficult to answer, which is why it's important to practice. What are you up to here? Um, again, this is another question that can be difficult to answer um, because the question, uh, the answer to this question is always going to be something different depending on what you happen to be doing when the police officer stops to talk to you. So what's your name? And then we have questions like this one and the next one. Okay, so that's an um, example of kind of the trainer portal side of the app. So what it would look like from the viewpoint of the person who's helping prompt through the scenario. Um, 
Um, another example of a existing training tool is a curriculum like Be Safe, which is a uh, movie curriculum. It's a one hour DVD. I think it costs about $25 or something um, for the regular edition of it. Um, but there are seven episodes and they all model different scenarios starting from crossing the street safely to disclosing a disability to a police officer. Um, and they have, I think about five or six different cards that go along with that video series. So if you'd like a disclosure card saying that I have Down syndrome, I have autism, I have a learning disability, I have an intellectual disability, um, I have Alzheimer's or dementia, um, all those different options. And they give a bolded list of how that condition might affect your interaction. And on the back is a spot for emergency contact. I did wanna mention um, that I do not have any experience um, with the non-police related modules on Florio. So I'm not speaking to those at all or to their utility or the worth of teaching other social skills that way. Um, just offering it as an option and virtual reality in general as an option as being a useful platform for other training tools. Um, Finally, I think that it's really important in this conversation to also focus on who else is helping. Um, as a student, it is not your responsibility to determine the outcome of these interactions. Um, and there are lots of people out there doing the work to train the first responders themselves. Um, so inclusive emergency planning trainers are in places like FEMA, local access and functional needs task force and other responding agencies. Um, I'm on several of those task forces myself, um, and the Institute on Disabilities has modules available for first responders to train them on what different access needs might be, um, what types of behaviors they might expect, expect from people with dis different disabilities, and how to make those successful and equitable interactions. Other people who are doing helpful work um, include advocates for non-police response models, such as CESA and CAHOOTS. Um, CESA, C-E-S-S-A, is the Community Emergency Services and Supports Act, um, which is a proposal in the Illinois state legislature right now. And CAHOOTS, uh, Crisis Assistance Helping Out on the Streets, is a model that has been operating for over 30 years in Eugene, Oregon. Um, and these are both models in which you dispatch medics and crisis workers for mental health and behavioral health emergencies rather than dispatching police to those events. Um, you can also look and see just for your own awareness, is there a mobile crisis team in your area? Is there some kind of non 911 alternative crisis line? Um, in Philadelphia, this number is the Office of Behavioral Health and um, baby Office of Behavioral Health Emergency and Information Line. Um, so that phone number is 215-685-6440. And there are gonna be different models and different phone numbers available um, in different places, but it's just something to know to look for to see if it's an option and might be helpful to you at any point. And I'm gonna pause for a moment and see if we have any questions so far in the chat. Awesome. Um, Stacy mentioned working on um, a grant to increase emergency planning among those with disabilities. That's fantastic. Um, and definitely, if you would like to reach out to partner with the Institute on Disabilities in that at all, um, we'd be very interested in supporting that. Um, and thank you for your work on that project. Any other um, questions so far about um, individual emergency and lockdown plans, about first responders, about sensory toolkits?
and Melinda, you're collaborating with um, state police and nonprofit to increase safety programs. That's awesome too, yeah. Um, a lot of uh, police stations and local sort of municipality level officials um, get involved with that work through um, kind of lost and found programs as well. So people looking for solutions to wandering and elopement um, and contacting their local police to be aware of the people in their neighborhood who might wander. Um, a lot of programs have gotten started through that avenue as well. All right, um, although we were mostly talking about disaster planning in school, um, I do wanna just mention some of the other resources that you might be interested in related to more general disaster preparedness. Um, so your supply kit for school didn't need to include things like a first aid kit or a three day supply of water, right? Um, because at school, it's someone else's job to worry about those things. Um, so the resources on the slide are for learning about emergency readiness more in the home environment. Um, TechEla has an emergency readiness plan. It's a downloadable 50 page booklet, um, which really walks you through every step of planning and documents that plan. So it gives you space to list your medical needs, to record the model and the serial numbers for any assistive technology you own in case you need to make an insurance claim if that gets lost or damaged in disaster. Um, and also to brainstorm extra challenges that you might face in either a shelter at home or an evacuation scenario, according to your type of disability. There's also a webinar you can watch about disaster preparedness. Um, the title on that is, Are You Ready? Emergency Preparedness for Individuals with Disabilities. Um, that was a 2014 recording um, by my predecessor, Jamie Prioli. Um, and then finally on the Tech Owl website, we have a form called Need to Know. Um, and that form is actually something we developed last year in response to concern over nonverbal patients not having adequate supports or advocates in the hospital due to COVID restrictions. Um, but it could just as easily serve to convey critical medical information and communication information for someone who, for instance, was in a car accident. Um, if you are a caregiver and you're typically drive an individual who might not be able to communicate these things on their own. Maybe you fill that out and keep it in your glove box in case you were ever incapacitated in an accident. So if you have specific personal questions or if you want some support to start navigating that home planning process, um, particularly walking through that 50 page booklet, um, you are more than welcome to reach out to me offline my contact information is here and I will put that in the chat as well. Um, I imagine there might be some other questions or comments that would also be helpful to share with the group. So feel free to continue using the chat. And then as you do that, um, I wanted to ask everyone to do take a moment tonight before you go to complete the survey um, and tell us if the presentation was helpful for you or what you would like to see us do in the future. Uh, as a federally funded program, data collection is really important for Tech Owl. So being able to document how many people our programs and services are reaching uh, is really very helpful for us.